Is there any evidence of Salutrians in North America? The evidence will shock you. Why is Haplogroup X primarily confined to the northeastern United States and the Basque region of Spain and with the Druze in the eastern Mediterranean, a seemingly disconnected geography? Did people from what is now the Basque region of Europe migrate across frozen ice some 25,000 years ago to North America? Did this group bring the enigmatic Clovis-style spear points to the Americas and hunt mammoth in Florida some 25,000 years ago? In the long silence between the melting glaciers and the dawn of agriculture, a lineage stirred in the wilds of North America. Hidden in the peat bogs of Florida, sealed in the bones of a man buried by a river in Washington State, and carried in the mitochondrial DNA of the Ojibwe and Sioux, haplogroup X2A remains one of the greatest mysteries in the ancient history of the Americas. Unlike the more common Native American mitochondrial lineages, this lineage appears abruptly, sparsely distributed, yet undeniably ancient, tracing a path that defies the simplest explanations. Across thousands of years and thousands of miles, the carriers of Haplogroup X walked with mammoths, watched ice sheets recede, and remembered a world older than memory, leading to much controversy around this genetic mystery. The similarities between the Clovis and solitary and spearheads is quite compelling, but not proof of a genetic connection. One interesting side note is that although the bow and arrow and atlatl or spear thrower is known in Eurasia from at least 40,000 years ago, both the Clovis and Salutrian spear points were too big and heavy to be used as long-range projectile weapons and were used only as hand-thrown spears. The bow and arrow, and possibly the atlatl, seem to have entered the Americas much later, suggesting that the earliest Americans arrived without long-range projectile technology. In many cultures, both the bow and arrow and the atlatl are used for fishing, as well as hunting land-based animals, so it is a multi-purpose tool. This is the story of their journey told not just through archaeology and genetics, but through the echoes of migration myths, the footprints left in bogs and deserts, and the strange survival of a maternal lineage whose origins are still debated. Long before the Hopewell built mounds in Ohio, or the Mississippians raised temples in Cahokia, ancient people were laying their dead gently into the peat-lined waters of Florida's inland bogs. At Windover Pond, more than 160 individuals were buried between 6,800 and 8,000 years ago, their bodies preserved so perfectly that even brain tissue survived. Initial mitochondrial DNA analysis of the Windover skeletons identified haplogroups B, C, and D, but also at least one sequence that was haplogroup X. Later efforts to confirm this have been hampered by DNA degradation and ethical limitations on destructive testing. Still, the presence of even a single X-like lineage in archaic Florida is significant. It suggests that X2A had an ancient foothold in the southeast, far removed from the Great Lakes and Plains where it is most common today. If correct, this would imply that haplogroup X was once far more widespread, and that its current concentration in certain tribes may be the result of regional isolation, migration, or population bottlenecks. To understand the journey of this haplogroup, we must consider the dramatic climate changes around 9,000 years ago. At the time, North America was in the grip of the Holocene Thermal Maximum, a warm, wet period that followed the end of the Ice Age. Glaciers that once covered Canada and the northern United States retreated, exposing new rivers, grasslands, and hunting grounds. Sea levels rose, drowning coastal plains and cutting off refugia where isolated groups may have once thrived. This environmental upheaval may have forced early American populations to migrate, split, and adapt. Some groups moved northward, following caribou and bison into newly opened lands. Others stayed behind, forming the regional traditions of the Archaic period, such as the Windover culture in Florida, or the ancestors of the Ojibwe near the Great Lakes. If haplogroup X2A had entered the Americas earlier, perhaps between 15,000 and 25,000 years ago, it could have spread rapidly through small, mobile groups. During the Holocene warming, it might have become isolated in pockets. One in Florida, one in Washington State, another in the Plains, and one that drifted north into the Great Lakes. The same warming that exposed new land to the north also drowned the coasts, 
erasing evidence of early haplogroup X populations along the Atlantic or Pacific shore. If haplogroup X was once part of a coastal migration route, most of its archaeological trail may now lie underwater. Today, this haplogroup is found at its highest frequency in the Ojibwe people, reaching levels of 25% to 28% in some communities. This makes them the most important living reservoir of the lineage. The Ojibwe, or Anishinaabe, are a Great Lakes tribe whose oral traditions tell of a migration from the east along the St. Lawrence River, guided by prophecy and the search for the food that grows on water, which was wild rice. This mythological journey, which may encode real population movements, mirrors the east to west expansion across the northern interior. As glacial lakes receded and new rivers formed, the ancestors of the Ojibwe followed them westward, possibly intermixing with earlier populations and carrying the haplogroup into the heart of North America. What's notable is that the Ojibwe also preserved aspects of red ochre burial practices, similar to those seen in what archaeologists call the archaic cultures around the Great Lakes, and may have inherited cultural and genetic continuity from these older traditions. This makes them not only the heirs of the woodland period, but of something much older. Further west, haplogroup X2A also appears among certain Sioux, including Dakota and Lakota populations, though at lower frequencies than the Ojibwe. This may reflect either a shared ancient ancestor or later admixture between Great Lakes groups and Plains cultures. Historically, the Sioux were not always in the Plains. They were pushed westward during the 17th and 18th centuries but their ancestral homelands lie closer to the upper Mississippi and Great Lakes region, where contact with populations like the Ojibwe was common. The presence of this lineage among the Sioux underscores its distribution along the central corridor of North America, a band stretching from Florida to the Mississippi Valley to the Great Lakes and up into the Northern Plains. This corridor may represent an ancient migration path, shaped by rivers and forest zones, where small maternal lineages could persist for thousands of years in isolated or semi-mobile foraging and farming communities. The great irony of haplogroup X2A is that while geneticists debate its origins, the people who carry it often remember a version of its journey. The Ojibwe speak of a long trek guided by sacred shells and spirit signs. The Sioux remember emergent stories and ancestral connections to lands far to the east. Even the tribes of Florida recall ancient watery worlds and the cycles of land and flood. These myths may preserve echoes of real migrations encoded in story. In a world where ancient DNA provides only fragments, oral history offers context and continuity. However, a controversial 2014 study, Salutrian Hypothesis, Genetics, The Mammoth in the Room, by Stephen Oppenheimer, Bruce Bradley, and Dennis Stanford of the Smithsonian, presents a case in support of the hypothesis, the idea that some of the first humans in North America may have arrived from southwestern Europe across the Atlantic during the last glacial maximum, 22,000 years ago. The article presents a detailed defense of the Salutrian hypothesis, which proposes that some of the first humans to settle in North America may have arrived not from Siberia via Beringia, but from southwestern Europe traveling across the North Atlantic during the last glacial maximum approximately 22,000 years ago. The authors challenged the prevailing assumption in archaeology and genetics that all Native American ancestors arrived solely via northeastern Asia. They argue that many studies have failed to seriously test or even consider the possibility of a Western Eurasian route, despite archaeological and genetic evidence that suggests otherwise. One of their central arguments is based on the fact that Unlike the four main Native American maternal haplogroups, which are all clearly of East Asian origin and well represented in Siberia, X2A has no known presence in East Asia, but instead traces its ancestry to Western Eurasia and North Africa. This anomalous distribution, the authors argue, represents the mammoth in the room, a piece of evidence consistently overlooked or dismissed by researchers committed to the Beringia only model. As discussed, this haplogroup is especially concentrated in Algonquian-speaking tribes around the Great Lakes and northeastern North America, and is notably absent in regions closest to the Bering Strait. The authors emphasize that this geographic pattern strongly supports an east-to-west dispersal into North America, consistent with an Atlantic crossing. 
They further note that the genetic diversity and antiquity is greatest in the northeast, implying it arrived there early and radiated outward. The article critiques several major genetic studies for drawing firm conclusions about Native American origins while failing to test an Atlantic migration route. These studies, the authors argue, simply assume a Beringian pathway and interpret all data through that lens, even when their own findings hint at pre-Columbian West Eurasian admixture in the Americas. One example of this is the genome of the Anzic child, found in Montana and associated with Clovis artifacts. While the Anzic genome shows some West Eurasian traits, these are interpreted by the study's authors as evidence of ancient admixture in Siberia, rather than direct contact with Europeans. Oppenheimer, Bradley and Stanford dispute this interpretation, noting that the Anzic child is approximately 1,500 years younger than pre-Clovis human remains found at Paisley Cave in Oregon, and thus cannot be used to disprove earlier migrations such as those proposed by the Solutrean hypothesis. The authors also highlight the tendency for genetic studies to conflate cultural and biological evidence, warning that material culture, language and genes rarely move in perfect tandem. They argue that genetics should be treated as an independent line of evidence, rather than simply used to confirm prevailing archaeological theories. In addition to mitochondrial DNA, the article explores autosomal DNA evidence that also hints at West Eurasian ancestry among Native Americans. For example, the Malta boy, a 24,000-year-old child from Siberia, displays genetic connections to both West Eurasians and Native Americans. The authors argue that this genetic connection might be better explained by a western route across the Atlantic rather than an overland journey across Siberia. The article draws attention to the fact that other founding lineages clearly arrived via Beringia and are well established in East Eurasia. In contrast, X2A does not appear in East Eurasia at all and requires special explanation. Some scholars argue that the lineage simply went extinct in Asia, but the authors reject this explanation as implausible and unparsimonious, noting the absence of any genetic trail across Asia for this haplogroup. Further evidence supporting a western route includes the archaeological feasibility of Pleistocene seafaring, with examples of early boat use in Oceania, Australia and even Scandinavia, long before or during the same time as the proposed crossing. The authors argue that crossing the ice-fringed North Atlantic using primitive watercraft is not as implausible as critics suggest. The article also addresses arguments against the hypothesis, including the perceived lack of technological continuity between Salutrian and Clovis cultures. While acknowledging these critiques, the authors point out that cultural tools can be adopted by other groups and that genetic evidence does not necessarily need to align perfectly with material culture. In their conclusion, Oppenheimer, Bradley and Stanford do not claim to have proven the hypothesis definitively, but they insist that it must be fairly tested. They emphasise that the unique genetic footprint of haplogroup X2A, along with emerging autosomal data, is best explained by a west-to-east migration during the Pleistocene. They call for future genetic research to consider this alternative route and to move beyond the narrow focus on Beringia. In summary, the article argues that the presence of the haplogroup in North America, particularly in northeastern populations, is incompatible with a purely Siberian origin and supports the possibility of an Atlantic migration from Europe. It urges archaeologists and geneticists to remain open to this hypothesis and to explore it using objective, multidisciplinary methods. And while the scientists debate whether this lineage came by Beringia by an ice-free corridor or even across the Atlantic in Ice Age boats, a theory favoured by proponents of the hypothesis, the truth may be less dramatic but more profound. The lineage entered early, survived quietly, and moved in pulses with rivers and climate, woven into the lives of women and daughters across the continent. Modern ancient DNA techniques are rapidly improving and sites like Windover and Little Salt Spring may one day confirm early X lineages in Florida. Similar testing of woodland period burials in the Great Lakes may fill in gaps between archaic and historical populations. What's already clear is that haplogroup X2A is not a recent arrival. Its unique genetic signatures place it deeply in North American prehistory, diverging from other branches likely before humans even crossed into the Americas. This means it was here during the Ice Age 
during the rise of the forests, and during the warming and flooding that reshaped the continent 9,000 years ago. On the banks of the Columbia River in Kennewick, Washington, a nearly complete human skeleton emerged from the muddy earth. Known today as Kennewick Man, and to the Umatilla and other tribes as the Ancient One, this man lived approximately 8,500 years ago, during the early Holocene. His remains became a lightning rod for controversy, not only for the legal and ethical disputes surrounding his ancestry and repatriation, but also for the tantalizing clues he offered about the early peopling of the Americas. Kennewick Man's nuclear DNA showed he was genetically closest to modern Native American tribes, especially the Colville tribe. What makes this relevant is that Kennewick Man carried haplogroup X2A, proving that it was present in the Pacific Northwest by at least 8,500 years ago. But, importantly, his genome represents the ancestral population from which the lineage diverged, according to scientific study. This means that he was an early carrier of the haplogroup after it diverged from other lineages. If the ancestors of the tribes in this region had already split from other Native American groups, this lineage must have been present and isolated in the north long before 8,500 years ago. But this story doesn't end in Washington. It can be traced to the soggy warmth of Florida. From a sunken bog in Florida, where a woman wrapped in woven cloth lay buried among reeds, to the banks of the Columbia River, where Kennewick Man died with a stone point in his hip, this haplogroup threads a delicate but powerful line through the fabric of Native American ancestry. It persists today in the blood of the Ojibwe and Sioux a genetic ghost of the first mothers who lived on the edge of receding glaciers and boiling swamps, whose footsteps have long since vanished, but whose DNA still whispers their story. As science and story converge, this story reminds us that America's ancient past is not just one migration, but many, woven across time, climate and memory. This seems to point to a central Eurasian origin for haplogroup X, with one group travelling east and mixing with those that would go on to the Americas and one travelling west. But the West Eurasian groups carry the X1 branch, which diverged from the X2 branch at least 20, 000, 000, 000, 000 years ago. In any case, this means there is direct blood tie between Native Americans, the Basque and the Druze, even if it is 20,000 years distant. The settlement of the Americas is a complex topic, so check out our other videos to learn more on this fascinating subject.